Thank you so much for being here on a steaming hot day. It's great to have your company here at the Centre for Independent Studies. Uh, my name's Tom Switzer. I'm the Executive Director uh, here at CIS. And if this is your first event here at CIS, allow me to say a few things about us. Uh, we're a public policy research organisation that's been around for more than four decades. And we're profoundly committed to promoting the principles of classical liberalism and conservatism. Uh, among other things, we believe that taxes should be cut uh, not for their own sake, but to encourage enterprise, self-reliance, individual responsibility and boost revenue. Uh, we also believe passionately in education reform and that given the right set of policies, students from low socioeconomic backgrounds uh, can be high achievers and consistently perform above the national average for literacy and numeracy. We're unashamed believers in the free exercise of religion uh, in a pluralistic society. Uh, we believe in the competition of ideas and we oppose efforts to try to shut down debate over speech that the sophisticates and the activists alike do not like. And we believe in promoting policies to address Indigenous disadvantage, which is why we are gathered here today. Now, for several years, CIS, first under the leadership of Helen Hughes, and then Sarah Hudson and now Jacinda Price uh, has been at the forefront in the debate of advancing indige Indigenous Australians in the economic and education debates. And today is no different. In recent years, calls have been growing to change the date of Australia Day, it's January 26, which of course marks the arrival of the British First Fleet to Sydney Cove in 1788. But whereas the activists seek to change the date, we at CIS seek to change the debate. In recent years, symbolic acts and gestures have distracted and deferred attention from the real issues that Indigenous Australians face. For the best part of five decades since the Whitlam era, governments and NGOs have been motivated by good intentions to overcome Aboriginal disadvantage. Yet the billions of tax dollars spent have not appeared to close any measurable gap. So today's panel will focus on exploring practical approaches towards Indigenous advancement. Now each speaker will deliver uh, about seven minutes each and then Chris Kenny, our host, will moderate a panel and take questions from you, the audience. And now I'll introduce each speaker one at a time. Our first speaker is Jacinta Price. She's a Walpuri Celtic woman from Alice Springs. In 2015, Jacinta was elected to the Alice, Towns, Alice Springs Town Council. And last year, in the May 29 federal election, she ran for the federal seat of Lingiari, that's in the Northern Territory. She lost out just narrowly after preferences uh, to the Labor incumbent, Warren Snowden, who I think has been there more or less since 1987. Jacinta, of course, is the director of our Indigenous program, and we're very pleased to have her here at CIS. Please welcome Jacinta. Thank you very much, Tom, and thank you all for being here today um, for uh, coming to my f first event as director of Indigenous research and uh, making it a sellout. So thank you very much. <laughs> In light of the reduced debate around change the date, it is the perfect time to give attention to the issues that impact the lives of Aboriginal Australians in some of the most profound ways. There seems to be no end to the Indigenous issues that regularly make headlines across the nation, ranging from domestic and family violence, child sexual abuse, youth suicide, poor health, welfare dependency and poor education outcomes. Vast amounts of taxpayer funds are spent every year on addressing these issues, yet very little appears to be achieved in way of actual problem solving or closing the gap as we now term it. A new approach toward problem solving is what is needed, which prioritises fact over politeness and action over symbolism. Too many lives depend on this. The Australian This Week highlighted that in the 10 years between 2006 and 2016, 23% of partner homicide victims in Australia 
were Indigenous. Compare that with the percentage of Australians who are Indigenous, 3%. Australia's National Research Organisation for Women's Safety, CEO Heather Nancaro, is quoted in the article saying, the complex drivers of family violence in Indigenous communities showed Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander solutions were needed, which may differ greatly from non-Indigenous solutions. Anne Rose disputes the overwhelming findings that customary law and cultural influences, in particularly traditional men's business, are significant drivers in Indigenous violence against women. Instead, Anne Rose suggests the historical impacts of colonisation are to blame. This exonerates violent offenders, but sadly is a conclusion shared by many publicly funded organisations designed to tackle Indigenous family violence. Our Watch is another organisation that also promotes this view, which perpetuates the narrative that Aboriginal perpetrators of violence are themselves victims of the brutality of colonisation and therefore cannot take full responsibility for their actions and behaviours. Such conclusions are not reflective of the lived experience of we Aboriginal women who have survived within the confines of traditional Aboriginal culture. Those of us who have lived our lives on traditional cultural terms have first-hand knowledge of the cultural drivers of family violence. As a girl growing up, I saw other girls my age reach adolescence and then be married off to much older men while still too young to be legally married under Australian law. I witnessed women being brutally beaten by their husbands, but the cultural acceptance of it was so strong that no one besides my immediate family supported the victims or reported the abuse. Ignoring cultural drivers does not allow for robust examination and debate to take place that may carve out better ways of addressing such a debilitating issue. One has only to Google the paper Ngara Law to understand not only how traditional Yungo law accepts violence against women and make no mistake, this is common for many Aboriginal groups. The following quote can be found under the chapter titled Marriage Law of the Ngara Law Paper written by Yungo elders. When promised, a bride has reached sexual maturity. Her promised husband may take her for his wife. Sorry, when a promised bride. A 40 or 50 year old man has spent his life learning the Ngara Law. His new wife might only be 13 to 16 years old and she will be sexually mature, but she will not know much about the law. Yet when she marries him, she has the right to learn from him all the law that he knows that took him a lifetime to learn. But if she breaks the marriage law, she must be speared through the leg. If the husband does not want to punish her, then her mother or brother or sister will punish her by hitting her with a heavy nulla nulla. In the era of Me Too, not a single taxpayer funded organisation designed to tackle Aboriginal family violence, violence against women or child abuse in Aboriginal communities has taken umbrage with the writings found in the Ngurra Law Paper. In fact, the Ngurra Law Paper was published in the Northern Territories Law Society journal without so much as an objection from a single lawyer. Surely a girl 13 to 16 cannot be considered able to become a wife to a man 40 to 50 years of age. Do such organisations believe in upholding the human rights of children given it is stated 13 to 16 year old Aboriginal girls are considered to be sexually mature? Is it not a human rights violation to in fact spear a girl of 13 to 16, of any age really, through the leg 
should she be found guilty of breaking traditional cultural law. Further examples of accepted forms of violence, including sexual violence, are found within the Ngara Law paper. Page 291 states, Spouses must not engage in sexual activity outside of marriage as it could cause danger to the individual's health and cause tribal conflict. Yet it only stipulates the consequences married women face should they engage in extramarital affairs. It states, a married woman must not engage in extramarital affairs behind her husband's back as it can be punished, including being beaten by her husband or death by sorcery. For the husband, nothing. And finally, as I mentioned previously, the consequences of trespassing on men's sacred ceremonial grounds on page 297. If her trespass is quite close to the ceremonial grounds, say within 200 metres, she may be punished by being required to participate in sexual acts. In other words, rape. This punishment may continue for some time, perhaps months. It is also possible that the trespasser will face the death penalty if the trespass is very serious. The refusal to accept a punishment may result in death by the Galka. The irony is Anne Rose is undertaking research that will, and I quote, explore the ways in which traditional law and culture promote social order and aid in conflict resolution, punishment and rehabilitation. Perhaps Anne Rose has gathered useful information from their consultations with Indigenous communities. However, Rather than just looking at how traditional culture promotes social order, they should also look at how aspects of it, such as the examples I have quoted, perpetuate violence against women and against children. Indigenous partner homicide rates are high in comparison with the rest of Australia because of the underlying cultural drivers that perpetuate the family violence epidemic. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics in 2018, the majority of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders knew the offender. This includes 88% of victims being 3,907 in New South Wales, 88% being 2,008 victims in South Australia and 85% being 4,355 in the Northern Territory. Of those 4,355 victims in the Northern Territory, 88% of them were women. As taxpayers and concerned fellow Australians, we should all demand our financial contributions towards solving these ongoing issues be better spent where common sense prevails. The truth is prioritised and diligent evidence-based research from the ba it forms the basis for problem solving. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander solutions cannot be reached without acknowledging the cultural drivers behind family violence, and particularly violence against women. Thank you. <clears throat> Jacinta, thank you very much. Well, the... Mundine surname is well known uh, across many parts of Australia, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous alike. And Warren is the ninth born in a family of 11 Mundine children. He was raised in a two bedroom house in the northern New South Wales town of Grafton before moving to the western Sydney suburb of um, Auburn. He has been a leading figure for more than three decades in working to close the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. Warren was the first Indigenous president of the Australian Labor Party, and he's led many key Indigenous advisory groups, including the Federal Government's Indigenous Advisory Group, uh, the Australian Indigenous Education Foundation, as well as the chairman of the Australian Indigenous Chamber of Commerce. He's author of Warren Mundine in Black and White, it's Race, Politics and Changing Australia, and more recently, Speaking My Mind, Common Sense Answers for Australia. And copies, if you have cash on you, are available 
after today's event. Please welcome Warren Mundine. Thanks for that introduction. Um, uh, for all those people who, who turned up today thinking uh, that Anthony was speaking, I know, <laughs> I know you get confused by our very similar physiques. We're very <laughs> athletic. Okay. And, and I'll just happen to have this book here by, uh, which if you want to grab, and there are also some other ones as well. <laughs> um, just listening to uh, Jacinta, I'm reminded of, of the conversations that are happening around in, uh, Indigenous affairs, which is about uh, truth talking. They always talk about truth talking and truth stories, but they don't talk about the truth. And I thought that was a, uh, a, a great introduction. It's always very hard to follow up from Jacinta, but I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, the things that we need to talk about, that's what we need to do, the real things that are the focus of, of the, our talk today. As people know, I've been very much about economic development and, and giving opportunities for people. In fact, uh, the, a few years ago, probably 12 to 20 years ago, I made a couple of statements. Uh, one was uh, in remote communities, if you, if you, haven't, an, if you haven't got an economy you move or you live in poverty. The other one was, I don't know anyone who has pulled themselves out of poverty without an economy. And, so, and also I saw a quote the other day which is, talks about, you know, independence and liberty where you, uh, you, don't, uh, you can't have real liberty without economic liberty. And so I'm, I've been pushing for a number of years about the real issues and when you look about the real issues of uh, global uh, economics and, uh, and uh, Aboriginal economics and Australian economics, and, uh, it, it's quite clear that if you look at the bad health situations, you look at uh, domestic violence, other crimes and everything like that, and health and so on, you, it's, it's, it's no uh, rocket science to work out that the most economically strong nations in the world have the lowest figures in all those areas. It is only within, except in healthy, healthy people, we're very healthy, look at me. Um, you, the, the only problems where we have is like within Aboriginal communities. What I see is a, Aboriginal communities for the, since the 1970s have been trapped in almost a, a, a Soviet style economy where the governments run everything and the Aboriginal people are sort of just passengers in regard to this. In 2014, uh, uh, 2013, sorry, it was when um, the Abbott government came to power, I was approached in regard to chairing the Prime Minister's Indigenous Advisory Council. And, over a f and I said no at first, and then over a few months, we talked about it. And what I wanted to do was smash through the status quo. I wanted to be disruptive. I wanted to really shake it up and kick it around. And when I used to talk to Aboriginal people in the, out there, they'd say, they'd say, why do you want to be disruptive? And I said, uh, is, are you happy with the status quo? And no one said anything. We spend billions of dollars in this nation, uh, four to five billion dollars direct to Aboriginal organisations in regard to uh, improving the lifestyle of Aboriginal people. And then when you add the other programs in, which is for, for the population of uh, the whole entire population of Australia, you're looking at something like the, 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 um, uh, was it the Productivity Commission told us it was about $30 billion is being spent annually in this area. That's annually. And then you work it out over the last 50 years how much money was spent in this area. So we just wanted to smash it. We just wanted to, 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 to sort it out. We took 115 programs within the Indigenous area and, and got them down to five, five core areas. Just on that alone, we saved $56 million in paperwork. So we decided to get cost efficiencies in. We decided to get economic development in. We come up with the Indigenous procurement policy, which has come out of the mining industry and, come, and, and what was happening in Canada. Canada now looks at us as, as being more successful in that Indigenous space because we, in the last, since 2015, we've been able to create a, 
un- just through government contracts, an industry of two that is worth two billion dollars now. When you add that to what's happening with the mining industry and that as well, which is about FMG, I, I chaired their, uh, their luncheon in, in regard to a billion idea celebrations. Since 2011, this is just one company, since 2011 in the mining industry, uh, FMG has spent $2 billion on Indigenous businesses, creating Indigenous businesses and supporting Indigenous business, and $1.2 billion on salaries for Aboriginal people. Despite what you might want to hear out there about Aboriginal people are not happy with the mining industry, there is more than 6,500 Aboriginals who work in the mining industry. They work across all layers of that mining industry, from people who, in fact, from uh, chief operations officers of some large mining companies like Glencoe, right down to the tradies and the operators in that, in that business. So we've got to start talking about this truth in that we need to really focus more on breaking through the regulations and the government controls that are happening in Indigenous communities so that we can create a more liberal, free marketplace for Aboriginal people so that actually can get into the mainstream Australian and wider global economy. Uh, A good example of that is in Indigenous art. Indigenous art has been on the global stage and is worth billions of dollars for the last... 40 to 50 years. And yet when you go into those Indigenous communities and you see those Indigenous artists, you see they're living in poverty. In fact, I thought it was quite funny. I went, uh, my wife and I went, because we love our art. I'm a very arty-farty type guy. <laughs> and we, besides my athleticism, and we, <laughs> lo- and we go and buy a lot of art. And, and we go to some Aboriginal communities and we, and we see the art and we see this incredible art that's going for thousands of dollars. And then you see the artist sitting over there on a CDP program doing the art. There's a lot of truth-telling we've got to get out there and there's a lot of battles that we need to ha- happen. And, and I'll just finish up now. Um, it's, you talked about Sarah Hudson. It's, 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 int- it's nice you named the building after her, actually, the Hudson <laughs> building. But um, is the bushfires here. Uh, I've been doing a lot of writing up and, and thinking about this and I've going to got a few articles coming about. Aboriginal communities pr- uh, up until about 1900 used to burn off f- uh, uh, the, uh, the, the fuels and that within bushfire, uh, that caused bushfires. In fact, up in, prior to 1788, it was something like 20% of Australia was burnt. And they did it in, such, in a very smart way so that when they burnt it didn't cause damage to the animals and it also didn't get up into the canopies up in up the trees and everything and in fact I've seen people do this and seen uh videos and that of it where they actually burn and, it, and it's, they just burn all the undergrowth just, and they and when you read the stories like from Macquarie and Arthur Phillip and that uh, especially Macquarie and them uh when they used to travel from Sydney up to the 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 bush at Parramatta up the government house that used to be parklands and when you, t- when you listen to the to the uh, uh, Blackland Wentworth and Lawson and the people who crossed over the Blue Mountains, and all of a sudden they discovered this incredible sheep area, this beautiful grasslands where you could raise and grow sheep and and have incredible farming. In that that was all created through fire control. Aboriginal people, we didn't have. Elvis the helicopter. We didn't have the fire engines and that, but we had were able to control the, the fire thing. I think it's about time we started looking at some of the indigenous traditional stuff that we can use, like fire burning and that, with our modern technology that, that we can do. And I think we can also make a, a, a great arguments in regard to how we can work together and working forward into this, into this, into, into the future. Anyway, I'll finish up there now and I'll, I'll be looking forward to the questions. As I say, we've got a massive industries out there working in that, but where is the money being spent and where is the money going is the real question. Thank you. Good on you, Warren. Thank you very much. Remember, copies of Warren's book, uh, Speaking My Mind, are available afterwards. Uh, Anthony Dillon is our next speaker. Anthony uh, was raised in Brisbane, Queensland, and he had a terrific mentor, uh, his father, 
who happened to be the first Aboriginal Australian who served in the Australian Police Force, little known fact. Uh, Anthony is these days a postdoctoral research fellow with the Australian Catholic University uh, just uh, across the harbour in North Sydney. He's a regular contributor to Sydney's Daily Telegraph and he's concerned with positive psychology, particularly with regard to Indigenous Australians and overcoming the victim mentality in order to, for individuals to take control of their lives. Uh, I should stress that like Jacinta and Warren, uh, Anthony has been the recipient of our prestigious Alan McGregor Fellowship for Liberty, uh, which we award uh, to uh, leading bastions of freedom at our annual concilium, uh, usually in Byron Bay this year, it will be in Canberra. For Anthony, only by promoting equal rights and responsibilities can our nation hope to find true reconciliation. Please welcome Anthony Dillon. Uh, thank you very much, and it's uh, indeed a pleasure to be here. I think this is at least the second time Jacinta Warren and I have been on a panel, just the three of us. And I always refer to us as the good, the bad, and the cuddly. And <laughs> you get di different people have different opinions of, of who is who. Um, so, <laughs> so um, that's for you to for you to work out. Um, it's great to be here again with my CIS family, whom I. I love because they've been so good to me. Um, thank you very much for that. And I, especially, I just want to make one special mention. It's so great to have Chris here to moderate. And with all, you know, you know what has been dominating the news, the fires, it's so good to have some common sense from Chris. So thank you very much. Chris. Okay. Just following on from Warren, who followed on from Jacinta, uh, Warren spoke about the economy, which was so important. And uh, um, I found, I, when I read about these issues, Aboriginal issues, I'm inspired by uh, the black American situation because it's so similar to here in Australia. Um, so the Aboriginal people here, the rela race relations between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people here is very similar to black Americans and white Americans as opposed to Indians. It's, uh, the black Americans are very similar. And one of my favourite authors is a fellow called Shelby Steele and he said the, the progress for the black Americans is as much um, about the psychological as, as it is about the economical. So the two complement each other. Warren's covered the economical. I'm not going to um, go there. So I'll talk a little bit about the psychological. And I, I will use Australia Day, given that it's this time of the year, as um, because it's just, it just typifies so much of what's happening in Aboriginal affairs. But one thing I want to make very clear up front, and I think this is why... Uh, CIS is such a good home for me, and that is Aboriginal affairs is everyone's business. Right? So a lot of people out there will tell you otherwise, um, and it's always seen as as soon as you have some um, Aboriginal ancestry, suddenly their opinion trumps anyone else's. <laughs> Aboriginal affairs is everyone's business, okay? Um, now, I was reflecting on what I was going to say today, and um, I thought back to the the first opinion piece I wrote on Australia Day was for the drum back in 2012. So I've been talking about this for a long time and the arguments I present are pretty much the same today as what they were back then because not much has changed. Um, those who are, you know, protesting and think that that needs to be changed and think it's oppressing Aboriginal people, which is what I'm going to talk about, are presenting the same arguments and I'm, I'm presenting the same counter arguments. So I will talk about those. Um, so just quoting from the article, uh, which I wrote many years ago, uh, I said, you know, all the controversy, controversy about Australia Day, the protests, uh, is a smoke sc smokescreen to the real problems that many Aboriginal people face. Okay. And both my, um, former speakers, um, the bad and the cuddly, I'll, I'll let you <laughs> work out which is which, have covered that, have covered that. So I went on to say, for those wanting to make changes relating to Australia Day, I encourage you to visit an Aboriginal community where the people are poor, sick and unemployed and ask yourself, how will changing the name of Australia Day or changing the date for its celebration help the people in this community? That's what I wrote 12 years ago. And I'm still having to say the same thing. Um, now, one of the arguments you hear from those people, uh, you know, like the people who attacked Kerry ann Kennelly last year and all that, they go, Oh, yes, but we can chew gum and walk at the same time. The problem is I don't see you doing those things at the same time. 
Okay? I see some one group chewing gum and another group walking. Those that are chewing gum, those who are out protesting, I don't see them protesting about uh, the poverty, the, the poor treatment of kids. Um, so, you know, th that's why we've got to do what we do uh, and raise these issues which Jacinta and Warren have spoken about. Now, one of the Im important things, um, I'll make one point with Australia Day, and again, this typifies so much of what happens in Aboriginal affairs. When they say the date must change because we're, it's a day of mourning for us, we're oppressed, we're suffering, um, and we just feel so downtrodden on that day, uh, which is a absolute nonsense. There, certainly there, there may be people who are mourning and feel oppressed that day, but they're not in that state because of Australia Day or the celebrations. That's choice. Okay? They choose to be that way. And the important thing is if they think like that <clears throat> and we do change the date. Now, I'm, I haven't discarded altogether changing the date and people present good arguments, you know, um, you know what is a better date or alternative to, alternative to And I am open to that. Um, not really in favour of it, but I, again, haven't closed the door. If you want to change it just for historical accuracy, that's fine. But if the reason for changing it is, well, that date does cause suffering to Indigenous people today, that will only validate the myth which people are living under now. Because the person who claims to be suffering and is mourning will be thinking, well, gee, if the government have changed that date, it really must mean that my suffering was legitimate. So we do need to be very careful if we go down that path of changing the date of what sort of message that sends to the people. And I don't think that the message of um, you are upset because of a day is the right message to send to Aboriginal people. That is anything but empowering. It's very disempowering. It basically says to the Aboriginal people, your mental state, your psychological state is dependent upon a day. And whoever controls the date, you know, whether it be the Governor General, the Prime Minister or whatever, whoever controls that date is controlling or apparently has control of the happiness of Aboriginal people. And what a load of nonsense that is. Okay? We talk about self-determination. How can it be self-determination if your fate, your happiness is dependent upon the person who can change the date? Yes? No. Um, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, how, how long have I spoken for? Two yeah. Too long. Okay. <laughs> um, just a bit about the victim status. Again, as I said, Aboriginal, Aboriginal affairs is everyone's business. And uh, if you don't know that, those people who do play the victim status will exclude you. Well, you can't really comment because you haven't walked in my shoes, etc., etc. Absolute nonsense. Everyone here, most of us here, no, actually everyone here has either come from a, themselves personally has come from a very disadvantaged background or their parents or grandparents, you know, you're the descendants of people that are from very um, poor, unfortunate backgrounds. Um, so, you, you know, everyone's got their own story. So the whole victim narrative, which is dominating Indigenous affairs, I think is destroying Indigenous people. Thank you. Well, Anthony, thank you for those stirring words on national self-determination. That was terrific. And now I'd like to call on our panel, uh, led by our uh, moderator, uh, Chris Kenny. Uh, Chris Kenny, of course, is a columnist with the Australian newspaper and hosts uh, a weeknight program this year called v Viewpoint. That's on Sky News every night. Uh, according to his critics on Twitter, uh, Chris represents a a dangerous threat to uh, polite society. Uh, however, I suspect for those quiet Australians who read his regular column, uh, he represents the thoughts and attitudes of the silent majority. Chris Kenny, over to you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. Yes, the Kenny Report, 5 p.m. on the Sky News, Monday to Friday, and I have a crack at the and media. And his book. <laughs> I do a uh, Alice in Wonderland version of uh, Media Watch at 8 o'clock on Monday nights. Uh, Anthony, you mentioned the good, the, ba the bad and the ugly. Uh, the, the last two uh, Canberra Writers' Festivals... Uh, 
Cadley. Sorry, you're right. The good, the bad, and the cuddly. So, thank you for the correction. Now we've got the good, bad, ugly, and cuddly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, well done. Well done. I put my hand up for the U word. Uh, I uh, the last couple of Canberra's Writers Festivals, I've done an event down there with my cousin, who many of you will know, Mark Kenny, formerly the national political editor of the Sydney Morning Herald and we and we do this event called Good Kenny, Bad Kenny which is how we're, <laughs> we're framed in the National uh, Press Gallery and when we're in Canberra I have to assume that my cousin Mark is always the good Kenny <laughs> but in this company I was hoping maybe uh, maybe it might be me, we'll see. Uh, look, the first thing I want to do, uh, I'm certain on behalf of all of you as well is, is thank Anthony Jacinta and Warren, not just for these great short presentations, but for the work you do day in, day out in your various forums in what is such a dif difficult and contentious area of policy. And I think all three of you do it with such uh, clarity, uh, conviction and courage. And uh, I really appreciate that and I'm certain we all do. And what I thought I'd do is just pick up on a theme from e each of you, uh, something out of your presentation, and then there's one issue I want to get uh, thoughts of from, from all three of you before we uh, throw to some questions from the floor. So let's start with, with you, Jacinta. Uh, you, you confronted uh, us with these, uh, these really unpalatable facts, uh, facts that you've grown up with and you've seen uh, at close hand. I know your family's been absolutely uh, central in supporting so many people who have been uh, suffering uh, in... Uh, in Central Australian communities. There's that tension you talk about between the traditional law and statutory law and the tendency still for statutory law to bow to some of this traditional law. Mm. What needs to be done to stop that, to ensure that a 13-year-old <laughs> Aboriginal girl is protected by law uh, and is given, afforded the same rights as every other girl in this country? Well, we adhere to international law, uh, you know, as far as I'm aware, as um, Australians uh, and Australian law. And uh, the argument quite often from um, activists and the left is about upholding the human rights of Indigenous Australians. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> why then, you know, I ask, I ask the question, all the time when I'm uh, confronted uh, by or having conversations with such people, why then do you not recognise the human rights of women and children, Indigenous women and children? And what uh, I think the UN doesn't do us any favours in this area either because quite often we have had to be rolled into uh, uh, you know, upholding the rights of Indigenous people as, as part of a collective, as part of an ethnic group, and this happens with many other ethnic groups, and we are recognised as part of this mob. And even in our country's history, when uh, in the past, when there's been the, the fight for the rights of Indigenous people in this country, uh, which, you know, took place rightly so, uh, a lot of women had to put their own individual rights behind the rights of the collective, if you like. But that's still happening now. It's still happening now. As you see with the three of us, if we step out of line, you know, we, we are targeted. We are, we are told that we are sellouts, uh, that we, we hate, we're anti-Aboriginal, uh, and, and, you know, we're, we're told that we don't speak on behalf puppets. of puppets, we, we don't speak on behalf of Aboriginal people, and yet, supposedly, we belong to Aboriginal people, and therefore, they have every right to tell us how to think, feel, you know, and, and, and use uh, cultural shaming against us. So what we need to do is uphold our individual human rights. That must be at the forefront of every decision that's made in this country, uh, of every argument that's put forward. We must begin to challenge uh, the ideas that come out from the left, the way that uh, these, you know, political correctness uh, doesn't allow, pretty much, for, for, for Indigenous ideas, uh, for these ridic the, the ridiculous things that come out from the left, to be challenged. You cannot challenge an Indigenous person unless you're... <laughs> unless you lean, you know, you're a right-leaning Indigenous person, then you can be challenged. But otherwise, you're not supposed to challenge an Indigenous person because that is somehow racist. 
uh, you know, and, and these views, these views need to be challenged. It's, it can be likened to what's going on with Meghan Markle right now. <laughs> you, can't, you can't challenge her for what she's done to the royal family because that's racist if you do. <laughs> the, same, the same thing happens when it comes to Indigenous issues and we have to pull it back to the very basic idea, fundamental idea of upholding the individual rights of Australian citizens and quite often, because we're part of this ethnic group, we're not recognised as individual Australian citizens, Aboriginal women and children in that regard. People have talked in the past, I suppose, about some of that sort of influence as the racism of low expectations and it flows through the education system, but I suppose what you're talking about here when, you, when, when you're talking about children and women being abused, it can flow through the law enforcement system, the social welfare system, even the judiciary. Yes. How do we fight back a, a, a against that? Uh, uh, do, do you think even mm. politicians, well, especially politicians, are very, very timid to actually take on these battles? Most certainly. And things like the Royal Commission into Black Deaths in Custody has set a precedent. Uh, there's been such a backlash from, you know, the Indigenous um, communi community with regard to Black Deaths in Custody. And quite often... You know, I see Anthony on, on um, social media stating the fact that you're more likely to die in custody if you're in fact non-Indigenous uh, than if you are Indigenous. And the argument is always put forward, you know, this, it's a racist system that's causing Indigenous people to be incarcerated at such high rates. No, it's not. It's just because Indigenous people are committing these crimes mm. uh, and, and, and due to high rates of recidivism as well. And... Um, so, you know, quite often in this system, in the judicial system, because of this, because of this bias that's now uh, in place, uh, perpetrators will often <coughs> receive lenient sentences for acts of, you know, horrible, horrible acts of violence um, and sexual violence. Uh, and quite often you know, this does not in any way support the victims in this matter. So the judicial system certainly needs a shake-up. Yeah, now, what was it? Was it, was it yeah, was yeah, I just want to finish on that because I, uh, I did the inquiry. I was chair of the inquiry into recidivism in, in uh, South Australia uh, in 2016, and that was not particularly focused on Aboriginal. It was across the whole prison systems in regard to that. So to do that inquiry, we had to go into uh, out into uh, juvenile detentions and other areas and that as well. And look at it. Well, uh, there's a lot of myths that's tossed around that all these Aboriginals are in jail in regard because they didn't pay fines. Well, we found 56% of Aboriginals who were in jail were there for very serious violent crimes. Now, when I say serious violent crimes, it's not just punching a person or beating a person or something like that. I mean, very serious crimes. They, they, they almost cause death and a whole lot of stuff like that. So we've got to start, you know, talking truths. And I, I didn't say that just to bash people or anything. It's about uh, if we don't focus on the truth, then how are we going to fix the problems? And this is, this is, this is the wide thing. Now, there was a court case many years ago, uh, the Chief Justice of the, of the High Court in Northern Territories, uh, he uh, sentenced a 56-year-old man to the standing of the court for a rape of a 16-year-old girl who was his promised bride. That caused massive uh, uh, backlash. And I was out there fighting this backlash as well about how can you uh, uh, recognise this different law system? She was just a 16-year-old Australian not necessarily Aboriginal. She is a 16-year-old Australian, in mm. fact. Mm. Why doesn't she have the same standing in the court as other people do? Absolutely. And, and eventually we did get, we were able to get that overturned and, and, they, uh, and he was given a longer sentence that for that thing, for that crime. It was a very serious, I think, a, fought, a battle. What we've got to do is keep fighting because I believe we're actually winning in the end at the war. It well, sometimes that was a shocking case, like and that's where, where, where the sentence was reduced because of the, the, the fact that this was supposedly a traditionally promised bride. Right, and, yes. and as you're saying, in that case, 
the sentence was then increased. But you've got to be at it all the time, don't you? you you've got to be at it all the time. You've got to fight. It's almost like dealing with the zombies. Once you, you've won a battle, they seem to come back and you've got to, you've got to stab them again. You know? It's just like, oh, my God. I, I, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's, I think it was my... I, I, saw, I come across a quote by Margaret Thatcher and she actually says you don't, you don't win wars, you, you win battles. Mm. And then the next day you've got to get up and fight you the same to, battle again. You do. You've got to fight yeah. every day. Mm. Um, now, um, you've been an advocate uh, for a long while uh, in between your boxing and rugby league careers <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, the, for the private sector and you, you spoke of course about uh, how the market economy how an economy uh, how jobs and economic progress is key for for Indigenous people, Indigenous communities. What, what, one point you made about uh, if there's not a job there you have to move to go and get it. Now this is this is very important when it comes to remote Indigenous communities. And I've got the former Prime Minister, your good friend, Tony Abbott, in strife. Mm. If there are remote communities where there are no jobs, obviously the, the people connected to that community all, will always have rights of access and a connection to that, that land. But should there be a requirement to move to where the jobs are? Well, th th there should be requirements in regard to w w going where jobs are. But I've been across Australia, in fact, from 2016 to 2018, I had is a wonderful TV show called Mundane Means Business, where on Sky and, and Win, and, and we went into Aboriginal communities and communities right across Australia. There was not a community that we found that didn't have jobs and the opportunities for business development. The problem that we found was that no Aboriginals actually do the jobs. Everyone's fly in, everyone's uh, the, the school teachers, yep. the, the doctor, everyone. It's just amazing. And, and also the, the uh, missing the opportunities of actually doing things. I, 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 um, I, I used to go into some of these communities and I'd go look at someone uh, who was doing a CDP, you know, doing the, the garbage collection or, or lawn mowing. And I, and I, I watch them a few times and I, I say, this bloke's a, a good little worker. So I'd go up to him and say, if I give you $10,000 uh, to help you buy some equipment, that, can we help you to run this as a lawn mowing, as a business? And you then, then get the Shire contract or whatever other contracts uh, you need to get with home care and so on about mowing people's lawns. And that was a very simple process of doing things. And the problem we have in Indigenous affairs is a total crippling of uh, opportunities and doing things. In fact, I wrote an article for the Australian called the, the, the donkey, donkey Proof Fence. And it, what happened was this uh, a community in east of uh, Alice Springs there, uh, past Utopia going out, and, uh, and what they did, the, 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 the business manager, what a title they gave him. This bloke was an ex-copper. No, no offence to ex-coppers. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, ugly. And... Uh, and, 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 and he was put in there to, to, to create businesses in this community. So he came up with this brilliant idea because he saw a lot of donkeys in the town coming in and messing the place up of actually spending money to build this fence around the town, this donkey, donkey proof fence. The only problem with that is is they, when they got to the road, they stopped the fence and then they started on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> and despite what some people think, donkeys aren't that stupid. They used to, they used to just walk down that road and go and, and just do things and do their business. So uh, this is the sort of, sort of stupidity that goes on. And uh, like, I used to sit there and I was talking to this guy and said, uh, well, um, you know, why don't, look, there's a school here and there's a, there's a, social, uh, a Centrelink now, a Centrelink office here, there's... There's the local Aboriginal arts thing. They need cleaning. Why don't we help someone become the cleaner for the school and stuff like that? Creating a job. Because we know from migrants in Australia and we also know from the global stage, if a no matter what, what how g glorious or bad a, a running your own business is, a small business, we know that the children of the small business then go and become doctors and lawyers mm. and other things. And we know that then that creates economies in towns. And, but the, the bloke sat there and he said, oh, well, we have to get a, an ABS number. And I said, that'll only take you five seconds yeah. on a computer mm. yeah, to do that. But there's all this stuff. In fact, I, I was, you know, my wife and I, as I went to this town, we knew, we, we knew more about that town in two days than he had in six months that he was living there. 
It's just, th and this is the nonsense that goes on. And I have these arguments all the time about how do we stop Canberra running Indigenous affairs? We actually get it, and Melbourne and Sydney and Perth, mm. and we actually start getting into these communities well, and being able to invest them. You look at all these. Bi I talked about the mining industry. Billions of dollars in the mining industry go uh, coming out of these communities. And yet, when you go into these communities, all we did was set up these these not-for-profit organisations, and the only people who get benefits out of there is the chairman and the CEO and other people. The rest of the people are living in poverty in that community. <laughs> Let's go to Anthony now. And Anthony, one of the things you focused on was this frustration over the Australia Day debate. Mm. Um, I noticed that uh, in Melbourne uh, on Australia Day, they're, they're, they're advertising at the moment the uh, Warriors for Aboriginal Resistance, a protest march. And war. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, th th this sort of uh, fanaticism. Uh, do, do you think that this is uh, the fashion of the time? You mentioned you were writing about it 12 years ago. Are we just going to have to put up with this year on, year out? What's driving it? Is there a real grievance? Is it, is it just politics? And, and, and why is it you make that very powerful point that we don't see protests in the street about the lower life expectancy of... Uh, Indigenous children, or the fact that uh, so many Indigenous women uh, face domestic violence. Well, why are people not protesting about that yeah. instead of Australia Day? Yeah, well, it's interesting. When you look at all the images of uh, you know, every year, you see them with the banners, and you have a look at them, they're mostly white faces, yeah. <laughs> you know, with the occasional uh, black one amongst them. But certainly amongst those white ones, I'll say, yeah, well, I'm Aboriginal too, you know, my, my uncle was Bruce Pascoe or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> And they, they, they do it, they do it to feel important, but interestingly, after the protest, they go back to a nice home. Yeah. They've had a good breakfast, they'll have lunch, they'll stop it at the pub and they go home um, and, and live a life like most of us are living, and that's what I want for every Aboriginal person. So, you know, we should be protesting about that, and to protest about the other things, well, I mean, it, no one wants to do that, you know, it's, um, e even to talk about it. You get shot down, you get accused of being racist. And I, I referred to it before, you saw what happened when Kerry Ann Kennelly made her, uh, you know, what I thought was a passionate statement mm. to be mm. accused of, of uh, being a racist. Um, now, just on that, that point, and I was speaking to a friend here before, it's interesting in the Aboriginal community, you can talk about the high rates of diabetes, not a problem. Talk about the high rates of violence, child abuse, and you're a racist. Yeah. Oh, why the inconsistency? Well, Anthony, I'll get you to start off on this topic uh, and, and uh, I want to know what you think about it in terms of this focus. This, the, 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 the topic here is changing the debate. That is getting away from symbolic uh, discussions like changing the date of Australia Day, focusing on what needs to happen to improve uh, 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 the lifestyle of, uh, and the progress of Indigenous people in this country to remove disadvantage. Where does the voice fit into this? Now, the declaration to those in the room, I'm, I've been put on the government's uh, advisory board on, uh, to co-design uh, uh, an Indigenous voice to government now, not to parliament, but to government is, is, is the remit. Do you see that as uh, a symbolic distraction or is there potential through a voice to actually have Indigenous communities demand the sort of practical solutions they need? Look, uh, there is potential for it. And, um, you know, although I'm not a big fan of the voice, perhaps the one thing about it that um, has got my attention, that I think, okay, maybe there's some merit in, in this, is the fact that you're endorsing <laughs> 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 you know, Not much pressure, thanks, mate. Yeah. <laughs> you know I respect you, you're someone with a lot of credibility. So it would depend who would, who, the composition. Now, if that voice was made up with people like Warren, where, you know, he knows about jobs and economics, that sort of thing, well, then I would think, yeah, we need people like him and sensible people, but um, there's a few, you know, people that are um, putting their hands up for it, and maybe even some that are on the panel already, that I think are not the best voices. Well, there's it. a lot of work to be done to see uh, how it turns out, what sort of a model could be proposed. What are your thoughts, Jacinta? Oh... The only thing called the voice that I like is the TV show. Because, uh, <laughs> my just husband his husband, was a just his husband did very well on that. <laughs> but no, in all seriousness, I don't have much faith in it. Uh, I think you know it's been tried and tested in the past, where you have these huge um, bodies that are supposed to be representative of Indigenous people. It ends up being a power play 
where mm. those with the ability to take advantage of uh, media uh, and um, have an education and have the ability to articulate their circumstances are the ones that usually end up running the show. And my argument for a long time now has been about allowing those who don't who aren't in those positions to be heard but it's being constructed by that that top end again and over and over and over i see it in so many different circumstances there are so many different power plays going on and so pe many people in, you know in the indigenous industry that are very quick to try and um, underhandedly cut another person down it goes on all over the place, uh, unfortunately. I mean, it happens outside, you know, it's not just Indigenous people who do this, but, um, you know, <laughs> we belong to this group where apparently we're, we're not allowed to do anything um, that, that rocks the boat, whereas when it comes to outside, well, the Western world, the Western world has the privilege of being able to use constructive criticism uh, we don't have that, you know, we're trying to push through and, and allow for that to happen. And I just don't have enough faith that we're there yet. If we had got to a point where that is possible, where we can use constructive criticism, where we can question our own culture if we think elements of it are extremely destructive, and where others can participate in that because they are our fellow Australians and it is everybody else's business as well without being told that they're racist until we've reached that point of common sense I don't think you know I, I, I don't have faith enough that this idea of a voice um, can do that and also we don't know we still don't know what it entails what's in, involved and the process that has taken place to get to this point so far I thought was it's all done being done back to front and a lot of money and, and resources and energy, I think, has, has already been wasted to try to get to this particular point while issues are still not necessarily being directly addressed. Warren, so, in a nutshell. <laughs> Warren, you initially uh, opposed the idea of a voice. You've changed your view. And in fact, you've made a very, very significant contribution to the debate by really, and I think a lot of people have followed your lead now, suggesting that if there's anything good to come out of this, it needs to be based in local communities. It does because the problem the, the problem we, we've had bodies before uh, in the past since uh, uh, since 1975 I think it was when the first one was set up the the uh, and the problem with this with those bodies was that they were all up here and it was the, it was the same voices all the time mm. all the time up there and what was happening on the ground there was a disconnect from the ground. Uh, my, and also, I don't believe it's culture. Uh, in, in our culture, if we're going to talk about culture, it is only the custodians, the traditional owners, can speak for country. They're the ones who can speak for that country. I can't go and speak in uh, Radri or uh, up in in uh, in uh, Walpuri or anything like that. That's their country. So this idea, so so to get a solid foundation and to get a, a voice that's coming from that voice of the country then you have to start at the bottom. You have to start and, and build that. And we have to work our way through governance because we've seen the governance issues that happened in the past. Uh, I'm a great believer if you, if you resolve governance issues and you resolve 90% of your problems. Uh, and so, it, and we've seen the, the problems that have existed in the past when we had the governance, we saw it happen with ADSIC, we saw it happen with a number of other bodies and that as well. And by having that base, and, and a solid base, recognising those people who speak for country, we can build a solid voice, a, very, a stronger voice at the top level. Thank you. I'll applaud that. Can I just in... make a quick comment? <laughs> just with re I, I believe, uh, you know, I, I agree with that principle. And my c deep concern is, um, particularly on the ground in grassroots areas, mm. is that I see, you know, particularly in remote communities, uh, the, there, there is a power play going on there and it is the powerful that do get to control yeah. what goes on in those remote communities. So it, it, it is about, and in some ways I think you're going to have to upset people to say, thank you, we've heard a lot from you, but we need to, what about this person who's sitting here quietly or what about the people that aren't actually here today? Can we find them and can we ask them what they think and what they believe? as well, and not to mention 
for example, in Alice Springs, you know, people who say, oh, they're not traditional owners of this country, our family are, and then they're not, you know, there's... It's there's, important you do so that because in, um, because in non-Aboriginal Australia, there are never any problems from people who lose elections or lose leadership. <laughs> they, they, they all just uh, offer their losers consent and move on with the time. Yeah, never can't be happy with it. Let's yeah. uh, open it up for, to some questions uh, from the floor. Uh, I think we're going to bring a microphone to you. If we start with this gentleman here, closest to the mic. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to ask you um, a difficult question that's already been touched upon. However, one thing that I don't think anybody in the room would disagree with is that sustainability is a basic requirement for the existence of any living thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it strikes me that remote Aboriginal communities do not have a sustainable future. The thought that I've had is that if you were to remove over a considerable period of time, more than a decade, much more than a decade, all government and private funding for remote Aboriginal communities that were not self-sufficient, that had the aim of removing welfare from people whose welfare virtually prevents them from developing yeah. as people with a sustainable future, whether they work in mines or they have to come towards the cities or whatever, by being bold enough to say that you are living unsustainably, we must make this change, taking the money away is the only way to do it. There is a, I, um, I, I come from that, you know, just by, the, by my blonde hair, I come from that age group with the first 13 years of my life I lived under that uh, the, the New South Wales Aboriginal Protections Act. Uh, uh, you, you're right. Uh, you, you've got to think back to the 1970s. Uh, the, you heard the word uh, sit-down money. It was the elders who come up with that term. These, these were men and women who were drovers, were shearers, were tough, hard-working people. In fact, if you look at the statistics, up until the 1970s, most Aboriginals actually were employed. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you go back through the, all, all the research and that. And it was the 1970s when welfare came into the Aboriginal community that destroyed it. They actually could not understand. They're sitting there. While well, people, government people, come out explaining to them, "We're going to give you money if you haven't got a job," and they're sitting there thinking, "We're going to get paid for not working." And, as, and they said, "Yeah, in a, in a sense, yes, yeah, so that's what we're going to do." They said, "So we're going to get paid for just sitting here." And they said, yeah, they help you, help you pay your bills and do, help your stuff. They just could not understand. So they come up with the term, sit down money. We're going to get paid to sit down and do nothing. <laughs> Which was, a, 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 but it's, and they, they believed that it was, uh, that it was going to be the poisoning, poisoning of Aboriginal people. And uh, I know Noel Pearson's written about, written about this as well in regard to, uh, you know, the, the welfare poison. And, it, and when you go into these communities, uh, this is what you do see. You see a, a group of people, and it happened so quickly. From the 1970s by the 1990s, the whole, a lot of these communities collapsed. You, you, you go into some of these places like Arakoon and other places, and they had market gardens in the 60s and 70s and 50s, and, and they used to work on the, on, the, on the cattle stations. They used to do... Now you go into these communities, there's no market gardens, there's no bakeries, they're, 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 unless it's a government bakery, and they fly someone in to do that. And the whole thing's just collapsed within a short period of time, and it is, and it is in regard to this welfare system. And so we, we do have to... And this is one of the things we did when I was chair of the Indigenous Advisory Council of the Prime Minister, was actually go through this welfare reform. And we needed to do that because if we didn't, then you were never going to get people back to where they were able to work. Because we had these arguments like, why would I do an apprenticeship? You know, if you do an apprenticeship, I have salaries down here compared to my welfare. And so we had to work out ways about how we could incentivize that to happen. And, and, and we had to make sure that, you, uh, you know, look, Australian taxpayers, Australian people are very generous people. We always help someone who's fallen on hard times. But what we forgot was what the original intention was. You've fallen on hard times, we're going to help you, and then you get back to work. Now it's become a career. In fact, uh, the CDP programs, I had Aboriginals coming up to me and say, well, I should be getting 
long service leave. And I said, what? And he said, I've been on CDP for 11, uh, 11 years and I should get my three months long service leave. And I said, what the? So this is, ha this is the mentality that's been created by this world. So I'm a great believer uh, uh, welfare should be on needs. That it should be, if you're in trouble, we'll help you, but it's to get you back into a job. And that's what Absolutely. it should be all about. And, and yeah. just on that, I was having a mm. conversation with my new colleague, Dave Barton. I, I want to welcome him to the team. It's, I'm very excited. I've, I've got an extra team member. Uh, <laughs> but we were having a conversation exactly about welfare dependency. And it's not just the welfare recipient that's dependent on welfare, but it is also an entire industry, yeah. organisations yeah. that are dependent on, on, on taxpayer funds to exist uh, and, and people's livelihoods. And this is the Northern Territory. Yeah, it, it, if, if you withdrew... Said, sorry to interrupt, you said that you know those, uh, those remote communities well. What about mm -hmm. this idea? Could, could you wean them off that government funding over time? Well, I think you have to. <laughs> I think it has to be done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it will certainly take, um, take, take time. You know, it, it'll, ta it'll be a long, slow process because no one is going to want to let go of taxpayer funds very easily. And this is, this, this is why people like us get pushback because people's livelihoods are being threatened. It's not just the individuals, but it's the industry as well. OK, another question? Someone going to help me out with my uh, gender quota here? The lady down the front, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Purely an accident. <laughs> Here's the microphone. Yeah. Hi. What are your pronouns? <laughs> <laughs> um, look, my question is directly, uh, mainly for Jacinda, but I'd appreciate uh, hearing all views about it. Would you, uh, what do you think about measures to restrict sales of alcohol in remote communities? Is that, a, is that something that can help in practical ways? I think in some places it has helped, and I think when it's community-led, um, that's the best way for it to help. I know there are communities where uh, leaders in the communities have come to sit together to decide on what those alcohol restrictions look like within their communities. Uh, there are some communities that have decided that they uh, do want to have a social club and they design the rules around the existence of that social club, uh, how, how the locals can and can't use it, and the fact that then, you know, if, if it were, you know, in some places it does work well, in some places it doesn't necessarily, but then <coughs> that talking about um, being able to be self sustaining, I know some places that ha where their social club has been able to then invest in the community and build swimming pools and that sort of thing. So there's a whole lot of, you know, other issues around, uh, you know, alcohol uh, reform. But, uh, you know, it, it, it is it's that argument, you know, there are those individuals who say, well, it's my human right to drink myself to death if I so wish. Uh, you know, how, how dare you take that human right away from me? Uh, but I do believe that it is needed uh, in, in many places. Uh, across you know communities, but again, I think these definitely need to be community-led decisions around yeah. what and, that looks like. And with regard to the human rights of the person who wants to drink mm. themselves to death, mm. kids have human rights to have breakfast. That's yeah, right. That's right. And uh, yeah, it's, and you're right. It's uh, uh, it, when it's uh, and it's it's really funny. Look, there's a there's a, there's a belief out there that that uh, Aboriginals that this has been forced upon them. I've been in a lot of communities where the actual the, the, the community made that decision, mm -hmm. and even where they had uh, still had alcohol sales, they made the decision about how those sales w were to be handled and 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 stuff like that. Uh, so I remember once sitting and going into a pub and 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 they and they in uh, a canteen in one community and they and they give you a ticket and you're only allowed to have one or two drinks and that's it and uh, and they. And they mark you off and stuff. So that's one. So, so when it's got that control, that works better. But there are cases where, where you, you, the, the seriousness of the situation is so bad, and I've been to a lot of places like that. There's some places that have these, you know, two, three metre high uh, barbed wire fences around their houses and community things. And they're, they're not there for the aesthetics. That's, that's just to, to, to stop people from breaking in and, and killing you and murdering you after they've been drunk. I went to one community where they actually locked us in for the night in in in, uh, in one of the the, 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 the you wouldn't call it a hotel it was a 
this sort of like accommodation. A accommodation. <laughs> and they used to lock us in for the night uh, because uh, people, uh, because of the violence of that was that, that used to happen because of the alcohol and that. So you've got to, y y y there's a lot of ways of doing it. Yes, the best model is that the community takes control of it and they actually uh, manage it and working with the police that they're able to sort it through. And the other one is, of course, uh, you know, if the communities, are, some of these communities are so bad, then they have to be dealt with. Mm. Okay, we'll go to another question over this side. If you mm. could pass the, this lady. Yes. Jacinta, it's Rachel Kahn here, and I just want to thank you very much for... Um, Lovely to meet you your, in person. <laughs> yes. Um, I had you as the last person on my last program. Yes. Um, I've always been incredibly impressed by your courage and the focus mm -hmm. that you have had on culture and cultural critique. Australians are addicted to political debate, mm -hmm. but they're not very courageous about cultural debate. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how you, as a cross-cultural communicator, have been going with um, your work around the country. I know you've had some pushback by Aboriginal groups, mm -hmm. and some of the comments here about the structure of of um, authority within Aboriginal groups. Mm -hmm. How do you, uh, well, how do you get through that those sorts of structures of authority? And have you had much traction in trying to develop ginger up cultural debate, cultural critique within the ob uh, uh, Aboriginal community? Something that we all enjoy in other parts of sure. Australia. Well, I, I guess to begin with, I see myself as a bit of a, a culture rebel. I do get that from my mother because when she was promised to be married at the age of 13 to her big sister's husband, she'd climb up on top of the roof of a house and threaten to jump off or climb up a tree and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill myself if you try to marry me off. So she ended up getting, getting the support of the men in her family, um, including her uh, original promised husband. I think he probably thought she was a bit too much of a handful anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> but, but, but my, my, my grandfather was an incredible forward thinker and he saw that times were changing and he also recognised that his daughter was a free thinker and thought, I have to honour this in her. And I believe that there are, there are certainly men out there who understand this. I, I have conversations with male members of my family who who tell me, you know, who wouldn't say things in front of other people, but who would certainly pull me inside and say, you know, you're right, things need to change. All, all that, for me, it's been about planting those seeds and I am beginning to see them start to grow. And, you know, I, I <coughs> for, people just have this, Indigenous people have this thing ingrained, you know, oh, you can't, you can't say no to culture, or that's culturally inappropriate, and all those sorts of things, very rigid rules. You just simply can't do that. And I said, why can't you? Why can't you? You know, I'm going to uphold my individual rights as a human being before anything else. And it's, it's about maintaining <coughs> focus on that end goal and knowing also that there are lives that depend on this change. And all change is painful, of course, but it has to happen. And, and as I said, I'm... I'm heartened to know that I'm hearing that there are conversations even within my own home community. I've certainly been threatened, you know, I'm going to get bashed up by some women if I ever go back out to Yundamu because I called out a, a male men member of their family on social media. Um, but, uh, you know, that those the a acts of violence don't scare me. I've grown up, I've lived through enough, I've experienced it for myself enough to know that... That's not what scares me. What scares me is the idea of not changing. Mm. Yeah. Sadly, I'm going to have to wrap uh, the event up there, uh, the formal proceedings. I know there are more questions there. I appreciate that, but people will be around to mingle for a little while. I just wanted to, uh, before handing back to Tom, just to thank Anthony, Jacinta and Warren, and also, of course, uh, thank the Centre for Independent Studies and Tom Switzer for having us. Tom. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Well, thank, thank you, Chris. That was terrific. And thanks to the panel. And thanks to those questions too. That last one came from Rachel Cohen, who had a, a very good uh, a radio national program on our public broadcaster called The Spirit of Things for 25 years. So a very good question, Rachel. Thank you for that. And 
I think it gets to the point that we've been making over the last 20 years when we've had space in the Indigenous debate. That is, we like to confront what I think it was President George W. Bush called the soft bigotry of low expectations. You alluded to that, Chris. Uh, Noel Pearson often talked about that as well. And I think it's a reminder that there is progress. There is plenty of progress in this space. Uh, my colleague, uh, Jeremy Samet, who'd been here at CIS for more than a decade, he's just left us to work at the editorial page at the Financial Review. He wrote a lot on these issues and he made the point in a CIS publication a couple of years ago that if you listen to the activists in the debate uh, and to our critics, you'd think that uh, Indigenous Australians, and this is Jeremy, are the perpetual victims of an unbroken historical change of racism and disadvantage since 1788. But it's an outdated view. And Jeremy's point, and this is the point that we've heard more or less here today, but it, it really needs to be emphasised, 80% of Indigenous Australians who mostly live in the southeastern metropolitan Australia, they have the same employment, health, housing and other so social outcomes as their non-Indigenous peers, 80%. The problem, though, is the remaining 20% of Indigenous Australians who suffer well-known social problems and gaps, they live mainly in rural and remote parts of the continent. <laughs> And these are, as we've been reminded today, a government-supported homeland communities that were established in the 1970s under the policies of Aboriginal self-determination. So there's still a lot of important work to do. Uh, we at CIS are very much engaged in that debate and we're very grateful for Jacinta for running the program. Um, so thank you all.